So, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mariam Lotfian. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at University of Applied Science um, in Western Switzerland. Uh, for my research, I'm mainly focused on citizen science projects and data quality in citizen science projects and public participation. Uh, and today I'm going to present you part of our projects uh, related to uh, biodiversity uh, data validation in our citizen science project. First, uh, let's see together a little bit what is citizen science. I'm sure majority of you already know about it. But uh, citizen science is defined as the participation of the public in scientific projects. And initially, it was mainly focused on environmental projects and biodiversity projects. But with time, citizen science has expanded to different areas. And now there are citizen science projects in really different fields. Of course, it's still the majority are focused on biodiversity, but there are uh, other areas that uh, citizen science is involved. Also, the number of publications in citizen science projects has uh, increased considerably. Uh, this increase in the number of projects has resulted in large amounts of data being collected for citizen science projects, which can be uh, useful to address some of the challenges in new or existing projects. But also, this availability of large amounts of data in citizen science projects has made citizen science to be a good, good partner for machine learning algorithms. Because usually, one of the big challenges for machine learning algorithms is lack of enough labeled data. So there are, nowadays, a lot of algorithms to, to, to get their training data, asking citizens to label data, to collect data, and uh, to be able to train their algorithms. So, um, of course, very interesting, but what is the benefit for citizen science projects and citizen scientists themselves? Um, can machine learning algorithms help in addressing some of the challenges in citizen science projects? In particular, the two main challenges of um, motivating the public to contribute to citizen science projects, so uh, public engagement, and also validating the data that is collected from the public. So having this introduction in mind, the objective of this research is to see how the integration of machine learning algorithms in citizen science projects can, on one hand, uh, simplify data validation and also increase public engagement for citizen science projects. But in particular, if uh, we aim at providing real-time um, feedback to the participants with the aim of increasing their motivation to continue their contribution to, to citizen science projects, but also by automating data validation we aim at simplifying data validation tasks in citizen science projects and improving data quality. And also we aim at evaluating what are the benefits and challenges that might arrive as a result of this integration. So, well, data validation in citizen science projects is mainly done uh, by expert review. Of course, we cannot ignore the important role of experts in citizen science projects. But relying on expert review as the main approach of data validation can have its disadvantages. For instance, of course, it can be really time consuming because there are large amounts of data to be verified. But also, um, the time gap between when participants make their contribution until when the expert validate the data and give feedback to the participants can be really large. And that can demotivate participants if they don't receive anything about what they have contributed or if they receive a feedback really long time after their contribution. So that is why we have thought of implementing uh, this uh, biodiversity citizen science project called BioCNCS, uh, which is implemented uh, in a Django framework with the goal of encouraging uh, the public to collect biodiversity data but having this additional functionality of automatically validating the observations that are contributed and also providing real-time feedback to the participants. Um, the approach of this uh, real-time uh, uh, data filtering and uh, feedback generation works as follows, that when a participant makes a contribution to the BioCNCS application, 
The observation passes through this automatic filtering of uh, the application. If it passes successfully, it would be classified as valid observation, else it would be flagged as an unusual observation. In this case, the participant will receive a feedback with the information given on why the observation is flagged as unusual. And given this information, the participant can decide either to modify the observation and resubmit or to confirm the observation as it is. And in this case, it would be the expert which, who would do the final validation of the observation. So basically, in this approach, we are not only, uh, on, the, on one hand, we are trying to reduce the number of data that would be validated by experts. So accelerating this process and improving uh, well, this data validation step in citizen science projects and simply simplifying this step. But on the other hand, by uh, providing real-time feedback to the participants, we are uh, aiming at keeping them motivated to the project and keeping them engaged in the project. Also by providing them informative feedback, we aim at providing them, providing the participants uh, uh, learning opportunity while making contributions. For instance, they can learn about species um, habitat characteristics while making contribution. So uh, the filters that we applied in BIOS NTS, we did uh, three types of filter, date filtering, image validation, and uh, location validation. However, in this presentation, I'm focusing only on the third one, so I'm not going through the other two. And uh, for the location validation, what we did, it was using species distribution modeling to validate the location of uh, biodiversity observations in such a way that we use the species observation data along with environmental variables to uh, feed and train machine learning algorithms and using the final generated uh, models to validate the location of new added observations. So as I mentioned, for the input data, we used species observations. Uh, in this case, we considered only bird observations. And for the environmental features, we used elevation, coral line cover, and we used NDVI from Swiss Data Cube. For the bird species, uh, bird data set, we used eBird platform. Uh, I'm sure most of you know this platform, but just in case, eBird is a citizen science platform to collect uh, uh, bird observations all over the world. And the data is uh, free and open source. Uh, we obtain the data that are already validated by experts. And uh, we obtain the data for Switzerland, and actually we filtered the data in such a way that uh, for uh, each species, we had at least 100 observations. So we selected only those species that were at least 100 observations already collected in the eBird data set. So as a result of this filtering, we ended up having 101 species selected. And for this um, observations from eBird, there are only like where the species is observed, so called presence points. And for training our algorithms, we needed both uh, classes like presence and absence, like where the species is not observed. But of course, obtaining true absences is complicated. And that is why we generated artificial absences or uh, pseudo absences. So for each species data set, we generated 5,000 pseudo absences in such a way that we uh, considered a distance of five kilometer from the presence points and we randomly generated 5,000 uh, absence points or pseudo absences. For instance, here we can see the, uh, the data set for one of the common species, uh, carrion crow or Corvus coronae, that uh, yeah, it had already like 3,000 presence points and we generated 5,000 random points for this species. The next step was uh, to compute the environmental variables around each observation point, presence or absence. So we considered a neighborhood of two square kilometer around each point, and we computed the environmental variables, such as landscape proportions, for instance, uh, the ratio of artificial surfaces, or ratio of mixed forest, average elevation, average slope, and so on. And in total, we had 19 environmental features. So we had our environmental features plus our species um, labels, presence, absence, 
which we are ready to train our algorithms, but just one step left is that to consider uh, cross-validation because of the uh, special autocorrelation exists between the environmental variables. It's important to think about special cross-validation, which what we used, we used this um, package in R, which is called block CV, which takes into account the range of special autocorrelation among the variables and proposes a block size, which we used a block size of 50 square kilometer for, uh, uh, for our study area. And for each, and we assigned uh, five random force, folds to these um, special blocks. And for each species, we generated the folds. And then we had our final data set ready to use and train our algorithms. We trained four algorithms of naive Bayesian random forest, uh, balanced random forest, and neural network. And we then compared the performance of these algorithms for all the 101 species that I mentioned that we filtered. So we compared the performance of all these, spe uh, all these four algorithms for all the species. And we have here the box plots that shows the variation of the um, performance of the f these four algorithms. We can see that neural network um, has a higher median of AUC compared to the other three algorithms. However, for certain species, it performed really poor. And uh, on the other hand, balanced random forest performed relatively better for all the species. Also for some species, we observed that when the, um, the performance was less than 70% for some of the species, balanced random forest was the one that always performed better compared to the other three algorithms of naive bias, random forest, and neural network. That is why we decided to use the models trained using this algorithm to validate the location of the observations added to our BIOS and CS application. Um, we, we obtained as a result of uh, this uh, uh, models, species uh, distribution models generated, a uh, binary classification map and also a map that is uh, the, the map of probability of occurrence of the species over Switzerland. So up to here, we trained our algorithms, we compared the performance, we chose balanced random forest, but how do we use that now in BIOS and CS to validate new observations? We actually uh, implemented an API using Flask, which is called Biolocation, and um, in, uh, using this biolocation API, every time uh, an observation is made to BIOS and CS platform, the observation is sent, the, the name of the, the species plus the location is sent to biolocation, and then the model trained for that particular species is loaded. And based on the location of species, the environmental variables around the, that location are computed. And the model predicts the probability of observing the species in that particular location. And this probability is then sent to the participant in the form of a real-time feedback with information of this probability, also information of the species habitat characteristics. So here we have like two forms of um, real-time feedback generated. The first one, if the probability of observing the species was higher than 50%, we were just giving the information, the feedback to the participant in the form of an additional information. Else, the participant needed to confirm if the observation is added correctly or not. Moreover, we also proposed um, like user-centered suggestions in such a way that the, if, the you, if the participant didn't know what to observe, they could also get uh, uh, um, top five uh, high probable species that could be observed around their location. So we did also an experiment of uh, this application to see um, how would participants think about this real-time feedback and how this uh, automatic um, filtering works. Um, 
the experiment uh, was uh, a three weeks experiment. So we did a pilot uh, test of the app during three weeks. During this three weeks, 200 people visited the application. However, only 36 people registered. Among the 36 people, only 14 contributed. And also among these 14 people, some were really active and some were, were contributing from time to time, which this is a very common pattern when it comes to citizen science and VGI projects. And we know the really the known case of open street map that this pattern of participation is usually the same when it comes to such projects. But moreover, uh, during this three weeks experiment, 230 observations were collected, which the majority, of course, were bad observations, but also other types of species was collected during this experiment. We also afterwards um, uh, sent a questionnaire to our participants to see their opinion about, of course, the interface of the application, how user-friendly it was, and also more important for us, it was like how they thought about this real-time feedback generated, how useful it was, or whether it actually increased their motivation to continue contributing to the project. Um, we checked that there was a high correlation between the number of participants, the number of contributions, so people who have contributed more, they have rated the feedback to be more useful. Although this, um, Correlation was not statistically significant, but uh, because probably our sample size was quite small, but still it was a preliminary result for us to see the positive impact of this real-time feedback. Um, as a result of this uh, auto-filtering, only 24 observations were flagged out of 230. And uh, we also saw that there is a correlation between the number of flagged observations and total number of observations, that this correlation for each, for, we checked that for each participant, and it was a negative, special, uh, statistically significant correlation. That is to say that participants who contributed more, they had lower number of flagged observations. So maybe that means that uh, people over time, actually, they got to learn from the, their contribution and thus Con uh, contributing higher quality data. So to conclude, the objective of this research was to see how this uh, con combination of machine learning and citizen science can help improving data quality, simplifying data validation, and increasing public engagement. So to do that, we implemented this BioCentius application, which automatically validates the location of biodiversity observations using species distribution models. And also, we obtained this result that the, active, the, part the more active the participants, uh, the more useful they found the feedback, and also more motivating to continue with their contribution. And um, as we observed, the number of observations, uh, flagged observations were 24 out of 230. So that is to say that this approach simplifies the data validation by reducing the flagged observation that needs to be later on validated by experts. Uh, some future work that we need to do is to also try to perform this approach for other organisms besides birds and to see how we can expand this approach of combining machine learning, citizen science, also to other citizen science projects besides biodiversity. Um, another point is that in our application, we mainly focused on sustaining participation by giving real-time feedback to the participants, to people that actually were contributing, but it would be interesting to see how this integration of AI in general in citizen science can promote initial engagement and bring more people in the initial step to contribute to citizen science projects. And finally, what is very important for us is to investigate more and to focus also on these possible challenges and also benefits that might arrive as a result of this combination of this AI and citizen science. Uh, focusing on different aspects of user engagement, data quality, ethics, and so on. So that is basically it. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions.
Thank you. Um, I will start with some online questions, then later if there are more questions in the room, I will ask you also. Um, the first question is, uh, can the user download the model to their mobile such that they can receive feedback when there is no mobile, mobile network? For the moment, no. It's, uh, it works only if uh, there is data mobile uh, network connection, but uh, that is something that we need to think about it later on because if they are really contributing during forest or somewhere that is not connection, it's, uh, it's important to get this real-time feedback, but not for the moment. No. Okay. Um, second question, uh, do you think that your method can be applied to other species where there are less available existing observ observations, so more rare species? Uh, that's a good question. Well, um, it's, uh, it's also a challenge that we had that even for our, our models, for some species, that there were like low number of uh, data available, the models didn't really perform well. Um, well, uh, still, when we, um, when we generated these random points, balanced random forest performed better because it considers like under sampling and um, reducing the, uh, the, um, the majority class, like the, the absences, and it performed better. But we saw that for some, spe like some other algorithms, it performed really poor. However, one thing that we think that can be useful for rare species, maybe instead of generating, for instance, only 5,000 points, trying to capture as much as we can from the environment, so maybe like 100,000 pseudo-absence points, and then to see if that would help for species that really have low number of observations. So this is something that we, we need to, to try to see if we get a, a higher performance for, for such uh, cases. And then um, very re related, do you think it's also uh, suitable for other species? So now you talk mainly about birds, but for like insects? Again, very good question. We are also trying to do that. We, we need a data set. So for birds, it was easy probably. Uh, Tom there, he is working with birds, so he knows that it's uh, easier to get bird observations than maybe other organisms data set. But we are, wor we are now going to start uh, contribute, uh, collaborating with an institute in Switzerland that they collect all types of observations. So they are willing to provide us their data set that they have because their actually participants are not active for some time and they are willing to maybe integrate this in their platform and to see if their, contribu their participants would get more active. But we also, it was also benefiting us to get their data set for other organisms. Um, before moving on, there's one more question in the chat, but uh, does anyone in the room have a question you want to ask now? Or did you already ask it in the chat? Of course, that's also possible. But if anyone wants to raise their hand, then let's have some interaction with the room also. Go ahead. Is there any uh, features like to add to the, uh, the current software, like uh, species uh, determination keys? And I have a second question. And what will be the, or could be the interest for kind of uh, ecological specialized institutes with a visa PGI approach? Sorry, I didn't understand your first question. Could you please repeat it? Is that about new features you could add to the, um, the application? For instance, a uh, specific uh, determination key, uh, could, could it raise an interest of the um, participating involvement? Uh, to add new features to the, to the application in order, yeah, to, for instance. Uh, yeah, like, such as like try, try to help the, um, the volunteer to determine the, ah, the okay. species. Well, uh, again, this is something that we are thinking to do in future, but one thing that we are thinking to do is, for the moment, we are ide well identifying species based on their uh, environmental characteristics. Like, based on the environmental characteristics, we say, okay, this, this is uh, high probable that this is the species or not. But we would like to have like this uh, maybe ensemble 
algorithm of one trained on images and one on our uh, environmental variables, and then to maybe also increase this uh, uh, possibility of species identification also for uh, for volunteers. And I forgot the second question. Uh, is that the, the interest for specialists, like you got the VGI approach, and what could be the, uh, the interest for s a kind of center of uh, competence and, and specialized for the... I, well, I think uh, mainly for them, maybe it would be that, because usually these types of biodiversity data is collected nowadays from citizen scientists. So I think the interest for them would be to maybe keep their community engaged because sometimes they, like as I mentioned, these, these institute that they have a large group of communities, but they said that only some of them are contributing and there are a large com part of them that are not active anymore. So I think the interest for them actually it was to see how they can um, bring them back. Another point is that they have a lot of data that is not validated because to have expert uh, checking this, they need also resources. They need also people to do that, uh, financial and human resources, that they don't have that much, um, uh, they don't have that those resources at the moment because they have lots of data that are not validated. So this was another point of interest for them to maybe integrate this approach in their platform. I hope I could answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I will ask one more question. Um, I think it's also, if you want to leave now to the different session for the next presentation, please go ahead. But for us to fill the time, we will just go through uh, one more question. Um, and that question was, um, is giving the suggestion of the top five species in the area, is that not biasing the outcome? And after you did that, did you get different types of results? Uh, well, most of the, in, in, our, in the test pilot test that we did, most of the participants actually uh, uh, contributed only the, the species that they observed. So um, the suggestion was not used that much, but in any case, we put it there, but it was not used that much. But I think uh, sometimes for non-expert, uh, uh, let's say ecologists or non-bird watchers, it could be useful because they were observing a species in some point and then uh, they didn't know the name. So using the suggestions, they could click on that name, they could have the information of the species with the image and everything, and they would say, ah, this is that species. So then they were adding it directly as, a, as an observation that they observed. But if it could be biasing, uh, biasing the uh, collected observations, that's a good point. I mean, I, uh, we didn't that much think about it, but uh, to be honest, most of the people used it as a source of uh, like uh, help to then con continue with the f normal way of adding their observations. Thank you. Someone want to have the honor to ask the last question? Otherwise, I have one last question. You said you compared the different machine learning algorithms, like na 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 naive base and everything. Did you also compare it to some kind of a baseline method where you just randomly say valid or not, or not valid and see how much better the algorithms we, are? I compared with Maxent, which is, uh, if that's your question, if you compared with the baseline, mm -hmm. uh, like stand, yeah. I, you, I compared with um, uh, the results with Maxent. To be honest, not for all the species, but for certain species that uh, performance was not uh, good for some algorithms. I compared the results with Maxent, and uh, the, the results from Balanced Random Forest was very close to what I got from Maxent. So, so this was the, yeah, the comparison that I did uh, with a baseline, let's say, standard. Thank you so much. Thanks to you.